One more questions last night, page 168, number one to eight. We're going to go over questions seven and eight here, beginning with question seven. It says, when you apply a force of 10 newtons to one spring scale, what's the reading on the other spring scale? What's the force exerted by the anchored spring scale on the wall? So um, what happens? What's the reading on this spring scale? And then what's the force of the uh, spring scale pulling on the wall? Does anybody have an answer for the first one for me? The, the reading on that spring scale? 10 newtons. 10 newtons, right? What's the reading on the wall? Or what's the force that's pulling on the wall with? 10 newtons. If this guy applies a force on this guy of 10 newtons, let's call this object A, let's call this object B. Object A applies a force on object B of 10 newtons. Object B applies an equal and opposite force on object A of 10 newtons. Now, if I pull with 10 newtons, okay, um, basically, like you think of this as a rope, okay, one rope that's connecting the wall to my hand. If I pull on that rope with a force of 10 newtons, then how hard am I going to pull on the wall? 10 newtons. Okay, I'm going to pull on the wall with exactly the same force as I'm pulling on the rope. So everything's just 10 newtons here. Question number eight. Walk X and Y are attached to each other by a light rope and can slide along a horizontal frictionless surface. X has a mass of 10 kilograms. Y has a mass of 5 kilograms. We apply a force of 36 newtons to the right acting on block X. Uh, calculate the action and reaction forces that the blocks exert on each other. In other words, if there's a rope in between here, that's what we're looking for, the force of tension in the rope there. And then we're going to change things around. We'll worry about B after we look at A, though. Um, what do you do first? You want to find, what do we call that, by the way, uh, FT, force of tension. Um, but in general, a force that acts between two objects, we usually call N internal force. It's a force acting on the inside. It's not contributing to the overall motion of the system, but it is a force. It's a force that's acting between two objects within the system. Um, we call that an internal force. That's what we're trying to find. Whenever we're trying to find an internal force, um, we first find the we first find the acceleration of the system, right? Okay. That's what we're going to do today. That's what we're going to do tomorrow morning when we have a quiz. Uh, period one tomorrow morning is find the acceleration of the system first. So let's do that by saying F net is equal to the sum of the forces. Looks like there's only one force here. It's the applied force. So we're going to say M times A is equal to the applied force. What mass do I use here? The 10, the 5, or the 15? 15. If you're looking for the acceleration of the system, let's use the entire mass here. The applied force is 36 newtons. Look, what we're doing is effectively pretending the 10 and the 5 are one object to get the acceleration of the system here. A ends up being equal to 36 divided by 15, which is going to be 2 and 6 fifteenths, 2 and 2 fifths, 2.4. All right, there is the system, right? That's the first thing you do is analyze the system to get the acceleration. And then you got to pick an object. Which object do you want to pick here, X or Y? Both, both of them will work, right? Both of them will work here. Okay, Bruce just suggested we pick object X, so let's do that. Let's draw a free body diagram for object X. Object X has a mass of 10 kilograms. We also have an applied force on object X of 36 newtons. Any more forces acting on object X? The rope. Which way does the rope pull, Nick? Yeah, the rope is pulling back. I'm going to call that FT for the force of tension in the rope. Maybe call it FR for the force of the rope. Maybe call it FYX, the force of Y on X. Whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. Okay, that's what we're looking for, this internal force that acts between X and Y. I'm going to say, once again, F net is equal to the sum of the forces, but this time it's a little bit different because I'm analyzing one object with different forces acting on it. It's going to be FT plus F applied. Uh, the mass here this time is going to be just sim simply 10 kilograms times the acceleration of 2.4 equals FT plus 36 newtons. 24, and take the 36 over by subtracting, we end up getting negative 12 newtons. So the, the force 
that Y is pulling on the rope with. Y is pulling on X with a force of 12 newtons to the left. Now, how many people, when they did this question, analyzed object Y? How many people analyzed object X? Honestly, I, I probably would have went with Y, actually. Anybody suggest maybe a reason why I would have went with Y? It's no better. It's just maybe a little bit more efficient. Yeah, yeah, it would be positive, but I'm not too worried about that. Okay, if I had found object, analyzed object Y and, and found the force of X acting on Y, it would have been positive, 12. But positive, negative doesn't really bother me too much. Jonah? Yeah, there's only one force acting on Y, right? So it would have saved me a little bit of bother. Not much. If I had analyzed object Y, there would only be the force of tension acting on it, nothing else. So then I could have said F net is equal to the sum of the forces. That would be 5 times the acceleration equals FT, the sum of the forces, which ends up being equal to positive 12 newtons. So you can see here a little bit less work, not much. Okay. Uh, what are they changing up in B here? Suppose the magnitudes of the force of friction. Oh, okay. We got friction on blocks X and Y are 8 newtons and 4 newtons respectively. Calculate the action reaction forces in the blocks now. Changes everything, right? Or does it? Well, let's see. Let's see. So we got the same situation up here. Uh, a 5 kilogram object and a 10 kilogram object. But this time we have a force of friction of 8 newtons and a force of friction of 4 newtons. Action reaction forces. All right, how is this going to change this one? It becomes F applied plus FF1 plus FF2. Because we get two of them, right? 36 newtons to the right plus negative 8 plus negative 4. What does that give me for an acceleration? Um, 24. 24 divided by 15 is 1 point, maybe 9 fifteenths, 3 fives, 1.6. Good. And then, of course, if we analyze object X, now we have now we have uh, the tension to the left, but we also have a force of friction to the left, which is eight newtons. So what do we get now? 24 on the left side, 36 minus 8 is 20. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. Thank you. 10 times the acceleration of 1.6 gives me 16 FT plus 36 plus uh, minus 8 gives me 28. 28, uh, 16 minus 28 gives me... Uh, 12, negative 12. Isn't that what we just had? Wasn't that just our answer? Can anybody maybe justify for me why that didn't change? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, it has object Y, it's half the mass, but it has proportionately a proportional amount of friction, right? So half the mass, half the friction. Um, twice the mass, twice the friction. And the applied force ends up being the same. So it's not a coincidence that it ends up being the same value of tension there. All right, our other bit of homework was questions one and two on a forces worksheet here. One said, find the normal force on the person in the elevator. So we got to, as we know, draw a free body diagram. Okay, this is no different than the last question we did for that matter. We got to draw a free body diagram. We got a force of grab. As soon as I, uh, as 
Let's move that back there. Okay, let's try this again. We have a force of gravity acting down on the guy in the elevator. Any other forces acting on the elevator? Sorry, not on the elevator. Not any forces acting on the elevator. We're drawing a free body diagram not for the elevator, but for the for the person in the elevator. There is a normal force. Is normal force bigger or smaller than gravity in this case? Zach, what do you say? Bigger or smaller than gravity? Why would you say that? How do you know it's bigger? Yeah, he's accelerating up. Not just because he's moving up, but because he's accelerating upwards. Good. The upward force must be bigger, and the normal force is the upward force. All right, so let's, gonna, let's say F net is equal to the sum of the forces, Fg plus Fn. Uh, we're going to say F net is equal to the sum of the forces. Uh, sorry, F net is equal to M times A, which is 60 times 2. We know the acceleration this time. Fg is 60 times negative 9.81. And then we're going to solve for Fn. So 60 times 2 is 120. 60 times 9.81 is negative uh, 588.6. We take the 588.6 over to the other side by adding, and we end up getting 709 newtons. How many people got that? Look, it worked out to be positive. Should it work out to be positive? It's a normal force. We drew it upwards. It should work out to be positive every single time. Two, the force of the floor pushing up on the person in the elevator. What are we really solving for there? The normal force. The only difference here in this question is that it's accelerating downward. So let's draw the free body diagram. We've got force of gravity acting down. We have a normal force acting up. Is normal force bigger or smaller than gravity? Smaller. How do you know, Bruce? Because it's accelerating downwards. So we're going to draw Fn a little bit shorter than we draw Fg. Same deal here. F net is equal to Fg plus Fn. It's going to look exactly the same, almost, well, almost the same. 60 times 2 equals 60 times, this is m times g, right? Is that right? Is it what? Uh, oh, it's different mass, isn't it? Yeah, that's, I made that mistake on purpose. I didn't, make the, I didn't make the mass mistake on purpose. Okay, that is 50. And Kelly, what did you say? Yeah, that's the one. Uh, notice I left a little space there to put the negative in there. Um, it is negative too because it's accelerating downward. Be careful about things like this too, though, right? It looks like almost it looks like the same question pretty much, right? Okay, I missed that. I made up the question and I still missed the fact that the mass was a little bit different here. All right, 50 times negative two is negative 100. 50 times negative 9.81 is a neg 490.5. Take that to the other side by adding, and we get 390.5 or Fn is equal to 391. Good? I'm going to have you guys work for the next few minutes on questions 3 and 4 on uh, the, that worksheet here. Um, question 3, real similar to what we've done here. Um, question 4. Uh, let me give you a word of caution right now with question four. Do not try to overanalyze question number four. Don't make question four harder than it has to be. All right, let's take a look at question three. It says calculate the apparent weight of the person in the elevator. What are we really looking for here when we're asked for apparent weight? Normal force, right? You're going to get problems involving apparent weight now um, through this unit and next unit. Next unit is on circular motion. And sometimes in a roller coaster problem, we might want to find a person's apparent weight at the top of the loop on a roller coaster or at the bottom of the loop. Okay? Even if you're solving a question involving an upside down circle as opposed to an elevator question, when I ask you to find apparent weight, what are you going to be looking for? The normal force. Okay, regardless of the context, when you're looking for apparent weight, the normal force is what you're looking for here. All right, so uh, let's say that the uh, force of gravity is acting downwards. Uh, constant velocity of 3 meters per second upwards. Um, how big is the normal force if you're traveling at a constant velocity? Zero. No. 
No. How big is the normal force? Listen, guys, if you're traveling at a, if you're, if you're at rest, you're in static equilibrium. If you're traveling at a constant velocity, you're in translational equilibrium, right? What's the net force in either of those cases? Zero. The net force is zero. Doesn't mean the forces are zero, but the net force is zero, right? Constant velocity, translational equilibrium, forces, what's the word? B word. Forces, balance. That means that force of gravity acts down, normal force acts up with the exact same value. We're going to say F net is equal to the sum of the forces, Fg plus Fn. Uh, F net is M times A. Uh, what's mass? 65. What's A? Zero. Uh, mass is 65 times neg 9.81 plus Fn. So what do we got here? 65 times zero is zero. Uh, 65 times 9.81 is uh, neg 638. I think it's neg 637.5, actually. 637.6. We take Fn over to the other side. Or sorry, we take 637 over to the other side. Fn equals positive 638. Newtons. Now, we didn't actually need to go through all this work here. As soon as we recognized that Fn was equal to Fg and that we were looking for Fn, what could we have done? Just said mass times gravity, right? Since we, know, since we knew right away that they're equal to each other. All right, if you didn't catch that right away, if you didn't catch that Fn was equal to Fg right away because it was in translational equilibrium, then you could have went through this process like we did and lo and behold, the normal force ends up being equal to the force of gravity. All right, I want to take a look at another question here. You know what, actually, before I do that, let's, uh, let's create a little bit of a simplified version of the question you're about to see, and then we'll show you the, the example that's on the board a little bit harder. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, what I call pulley problems right now. Let's say we've got a, a mass of 10 kilograms right here, and we've got a... Let's say a pulley there. Uh, maybe we've got a mass of five kilograms right here. A little bit odd that the five is bigger in volume than the 10, but eh, it's less dense, whatever. Um, no friction. Okay, let's say there's no friction acting on this. We want to find the acceleration of this system. What do we do? Well, we can start drawing free body diagrams. Look, here's a force of gravity acting down on this guy, right? We got a normal force acting up and a force of gravity acting down on the five, but they're going to cancel each other out. All we're going to do here is say, look, there's one force acting. By the way, there is a force inside here, right? An internal force of tension between these two objects. But if we're looking for the acceleration, then we're not, we're not looking to include the internal forces. All we're going to do here is say F net is equal to the sum of the forces that don't cancel out. It's equal to Fg, that's it. What mass would I use here? 10, 5, 15? Guys, this question that we're doing right here is no different than when we were analyzing that question at the beginning of class like this. I mean, think about that. We have two objects tied together, being pulled by one force. What maths did I use when I was analyzing this question? Both of them, right? So why wouldn't I use both of them here? That's exactly what I do. The net force here is going to be mass, which is 15 kilograms times the acceleration, is equal to Fg. Well, this is tricky now, though. What mass do I use for the force of gravity? I use the 10. There is a force of gravity acting on the 5, but it cancels with the normal force here. Do you see that? Fn and Fg for the 5 cancel. Fn and Fg for the, the 10 don't cancel. So we're going to say the force of gravity is 10 times negative 9.81. 15 times A is equal to 10 times negative 9.81. So we're going to say 15 times A is equal to negative 98.1. And then I'm going to say A is equal to neg 98.1 divide it by 15. And when I do that, I end up getting 6.54 or negative 6.54. Right? 
Now I could I could turn around now and find the tension in that rope, right? And I could do that by picking one object, either the five or the ten, and treating it just like I did, just like I did the question there at the beginning of class. Yep. Um, yeah, no, you know what? That's a good point, actually, if I understand your question right. In fact, I like to do that sometimes. Maybe not so much for this question, because this is a, a rather straightforward one as far as this, these poly problems go. But when the questions get a little bit harder, in fact, in the next example, you'll see that I actually like to, Bruce said, you know, if it was straightened out, then the force would be to the left. I often do that, actually. I redraw it like this and then say FG is to the left. That make sense? No, it's not really to the left, right? But sometimes that's actually useful to do, draw it to the left there. In this question, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that it necessarily helps us to draw the force of friction to the left, straightening it out like this. But in the next question, I think it does. This time we've got a 20-kilogram truck tire. I got a horizontal frictionless surface. The tires attached to two light ropes that pass over light frictionless pulleys, uh, pails B and C. Here's the masses. We want to find the magnitude of the acceleration. All right, let's let's label these masses here first. Here, mass B is um, eight kilograms. Uh, the tire is what, twenty kilograms, and uh, mass C is uh, six kilograms. So what do we have acting here? Um, well, we have, first of all, we have gravity and the normal force acting right here, right? But what do we know about gravity and the normal force on tire A? They cancel. So when we start dealing with gravity, we're not going to pay any attention to gravity on the tire because it cancels out with, with the normal force. That's gone. What else we got? Friction? No, there's no friction. Friction, it tells us it's a frictionless surface. It's like a table made of ice. We got, we got gravity on the pails, so we got gravity acting down on this guy. I'm going to call that FB, even though it's really FG. You know what? Maybe I should call it FGB, just so we remember that it's, just so we remember it's gravity, right? Force of gravity acting on B. Um, any more forces here? Yeah, we got a force of gravity acting on the six. Is it bigger or smaller than the force of gravity Bigger or smaller than the force of gravity acting on the uh, eight? Yeah, smaller because we know it's a six kilogram mass being pulled down instead of an eight. So we're going to draw that a little bit shorter here. I'm going to call that FGA. Now, we can absolutely say F net is equal to the sum of the forces here, FGB plus FGA. What's the net force? M times A, right? What mass do I use? All of it, right? All of it. 8 plus 20 plus 6 is 34 kilograms. FGB is about 8 times negative 9.81, right? Because it's downwards. Plus FGA is 6 times negative 9.81 because it's downwards. Here is where what Bruce said in the first question that we just did a second ago, so here's where it becomes really, really useful, actually. There's a problem with what I just did here. There's a mistake. And I think if we straighten it out, like Bruce said maybe we could do in the, in the last question, I think that reduces significantly the chances of making that mistake. Nick, what's the mistake? Yeah, well, uh, well no, it's, okay, pale C is going to go upwards because, because pale B is heavier, right? Okay, but gravity is still acting downwards on it, right? So you're, I, I thought you had it there, but not quite. Just because it moves up doesn't mean gravity's up, right? Gravity still acts down. Well, that's an internal force though, right? If you're talking about that force that's pulling up pale C, that's an internal force. And when we're finding the acceleration, we're not going to look at the internal forces. If I'm analyzing only pale C and trying to find it, what the value of that tension is, then yeah, we'd include that, right? Nobody sees it? Oh, Holly sees it. Uh, 
um, yeah, like basically what we're going to do is say that that's six times positive 9.81. It's a positive force. But wait a second, it's downward. Why do we make it a positive force, Holly? N not, no, not because it's going up. No, it doesn't. The direction of the movement doesn't make any difference. Okay, which way is the force acting? The force is acting down. The force is acting down. Which way does the force act? Down. So why don't we make them both negative? Because it's the direction of the force that determines what the sign is going to be. Yeah, Alex? Yeah, let's lay it out here. Okay, let's lay it out. We've got um, object B, we've got object A, and we've got object C. We're going to say FGB would act to the left there, right? If I straightened it out, FGC would act to the or sorry, that would be FGC here, wouldn't it? Not FGA. FGC would act to the right if I straighten it out. See what I mean here, guys? It's easier to, to see that it's got to be to the right or positive value when I straighten it out like that. It's not necessary to do this, but I think it's useful in a case like this. And this last question, not so much because it was only one force acting, and it didn't really matter whether I called it positive or negative because it was only the one force. But as soon as you get into a question like this, yeah, maybe it becomes useful to straighten it out like that. If you can catch the fact that those forces oppose each other, that's really the deal here, right? Because the forces oppose each other, one's going to be positive, one's going to be negative. This is just a way for me to remember that they oppose each other, and therefore one's going to be positive, one's going to be negative. Okay, 34 times A is equal to 8 times uh, 9.81. What do you get? 78.48. 78 That's going to be negative, though. Uh, plus 6 times 9.81 is, I think, uh, 58.86. Is that right? So we're going to say... Um, 78.48 negative plus uh, 58.86 is about 20, 19.62, say. Negative 19.62. And A is therefore going to be equal to neg 19.62 divided by 34, which is about 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Negative 0 0.57 meters per second squared. I'm sorry? Two digits, yeah, two digits. If you go back to your original data here, we got two digits. Oh, is it 0 0.58? 0 0.58? 0 0.77? 0.577? Okay, that rounds to 0.58 then, right? So how is this any different than the questions we've been doing? Well, it's not really. You just got to be careful of something, right? You just got to be careful of the positive, positive direction and the negative direction. You also have to recognize that, look, you got to include the total mass here instead of the mass of one of them. And you got to include the mass of one of them here as opposed to the total and the mass of one of them here as opposed to the total. Okay, but I think the big thing here is this. One's positive and one's negative. All right? Let's have a peek at question number two. It says, uh, if the tire in example 3.11 is replaced by a car tire of mass 15 kilograms, what's the acceleration of each object? So here's, our, here's the example question. The car tire has a mass of 15 kilograms. Uh, what was the mass of pail, pail B? Uh, I think we go back to, the, the, back to the original. So we got eight kilograms. And what do we got here? Six kilograms. So we're going to say, well, I'm going to straighten it out here because I think that that's useful to do. Here's my tire. It's 15 kilograms. Here's my pail. It's 8 kilograms. Here's my other pail. It's 6 kilograms. I get pulled this way. I'm going to call that FGB. And I get pulled this way. It's a little bit smaller of a force this way. I'm going to call this FGC. I'm going to say, this guy, gravity and normal force cancel, right? So I'm not going to worry too much about it about those guys. So I'm going to say now F net is equal to the sum of the forces, F, G, B, 
plus FGC. Hey, what if there was friction here? How would this change if there was friction involved? Just more forces, right? If there was friction, which way would it act? This way. So if there was friction, it would be on the 15 kilogram object tire because it's the only one in contact, and it would be to the right. And then we just add in another force right there, the force of friction, right? It would make it harder, right? Just a little bit more work. Okay, I'll erase that because, of course, there isn't friction in this case. The net force is equal to, what's my total mass there? 29 kilograms times the acceleration equals FGB, which is 8 times negative 9.81, and FGC, which is 6 times positive 9.81. Why did I make that positive? 6 times positive? Because it's in the opposite direction, yeah. Now, I like to make this one negative and this one positive because it's left and right. Some people make, like to make this one actually positive and this one negative because this one's bigger. Okay. I don't really care what you do there, but one of them's got to be negative and one of them's got to be positive. Uh, so what do we get here? 29A is equal to uh, 8 times 9.81, 6 times 9.81 uh, gives me a negative 19.62. And when you divide that by 29, we get negative 0 0.68 meters per second squared. Now, there's my acceleration, right? Negative 0.68. It means the system accelerates this way, right? Which means the pail B accelerates 0.62 downwards. The tire accelerates at 0.68 to, 0.68 to the left. And then pail C accelerates at 0.68 upwards. All right. Does that make some sense?